Welcome to Net Life with Dawn Staley. That's still kind of weird for me to actually say my name in that way, but but welcome everybody. We're getting close to the end of the season, and I've been having a great time potting with my Net Life fams. And I hope that you're enjoying this as much as I am. This week's interview is with the president of the University of South Carolina, Harris Pastides. We talk about all kinds of things, from making college more accessible to the NIL. But before we get to that, one of South Carolina's all-time greats, all-time, when I say all-time, I mean basketball, I mean in your community, I mean the wretchedness of her, Asia Wilson is joining me to talk about March Madness. Asia, I was on episode with you yes. and Feast, um, the T. Yes. I, I, I haven't seen an episode as of lately. Has the T turned to coffee? Just a little only, bit. Just a little bit? Just a little bit. Because, you know, we got stuff going on. You know, Fees, she's welcome in a little baby. Like, we got to let her get into that. So we had to get that first. <laughs> Did, did she actually come out on the T to say she was with no. a child? No, she had a bigger she had a bigger coming out party. It was like on People magazine, like, come on now, the T not there yet. <laughs> but she did it. She did it the right way. I love her for that. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thank you for coming on. And I, I just want to recap. Um, we started our our NCAA tournament run. We played Howard in the first round, and um, Howard uh, was a, a formidable opponent. Um, obviously, I know Coach Ty Grace, who <laughs> had her team playing pretty, pretty, pretty good. I mean, when when they played against uh, the University of Incarnate Word, what a what a incredible display of basketball for the first four. Um, and so we look forward to to playing Howard. Um, I, I will have to say this, when, when we did watch that first four game um, in Colonial Life Arena, my eyes immediately went to the cheerleaders in the band from Howard. Um, like, seriously, they, they made me, they were twerking. And you know, when I see people twerking, you know, I got you know, I get a little twitch in my hip and I want to, you know, I want to get down, but they really make you think you can do it. That's how good they are. And the band, <clears throat> the, the band, I just went to a yeah. Maxwell concert and the band was playing Maxwell. The band <clears throat> was playing, you know, everything. So um, talented. <laughs> talented, right? So oh, talented. Hey. So Asia, if you were, if you played a, 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 a um, if you played a musical instrument, what would it be? I feel like I got a mean little tambourine on me. <laughs> it's good, but yeah, I feel like I got a mean tambourine. Oh, um, I think that's a tambourine. That, that ain't, you know, that a tambourine? No, no drums, no flute, no bass, no. No, because you need a little accent, a little tune, like just ready. I don't need well, so a background. You told yeah, the background. I okay. Yeah, I, I don't need the big instruments. I'm cool I there. You. I got you. I got you. And then we followed up and played Miami in the second round, which which was pretty cool. I, you know, a lot of people I saw on social media said we took basketball back a couple of years because we couldn't throw it in the ocean. Um, but but still, uh for 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 how bad we played from an offensive standpoint, huh. the the defense was was something I would say amazing, and and yeah. I know I coached the team, but we really and I and I, I often question whether or not we're expending so much energy on the defensive side of the ball that you know we don't have any energy left for the the offensive side of the ball. Uh, what's your what's your take on our team? Did you even watch our our game yesterday? Don't do that. I I always try to watch our game. Yes, I watch both, and I think it's like. It's just one of those games. I, I think the Miami game also, like you showed, is this the best defensive team we've ever coached? Um, any team <laughs> that didn't include you is going to be better than your era defensively. But I, <laughs> I will say this honestly: 
This team was committed to playing defense, the core of them, from their very first year of college. Oh, so damn. they, Yeah, yeah, like you didn't get committed, although the, I don't know why the coaches voted you for defensive player of the year, and I think it had to do with you blocking. Twice. I don't twice. Yeah, twice. That's I mean, not a fluke. If it's twice, it's not a fluke. But but I, I want to hear from you. Is this the best defensive team that South Carolina has ever put on the floor? I mean, I'm going to be biased and say no. I think my freshman year we had a pretty tight defensive team. But this team here is probably the best, I think, just locked in wise. Like, you can tell that they're all just really, like, all in and locked into the system. And, yes, I think this is the probably the most disciplined team you probably had. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the most disciplined team. That's the why they are the better defensive team. But I mean, that's really honestly what I saw in these games. Like how focused and locked in they were on the defensive end against um, the U was just pretty nice. And of course, when the offensive side isn't going well, something got to step up. Hello. And it was an ugly win, but a win is a win. It's a lot of wins. So <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> At this so, point. So Asia, you you were when you were in college. You were a number one seed, um, yeah. probably a, a few years of your of your career. Um, mm -hmm. So the so the last thing you want to be in is is a close game uh, with a, a sixteen seed and potentially yeah. get upset um, in historic fashion. But only one, only one sixteen seed has ever beat a one seed. So do you think players are focused on? trying to put the game away as quickly as possible. What was your biggest takeaway um, from when you played uh, as the number one seed in uh, the NCAA tournament? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me was like, not let's get this game over with, but let's get through this so we are not that team that gets beat by that, Cinder that Cinderella team. I think it was like Quinnipiac was like uh, our junior, my junior year. And that was the Cinderella team. And we saw them in regionals. And I was kind of like shaking in my boots because you just don't know. Like it's March. It falls in the hands of the refs. Everything, anything can happen. So for me, I was super nervous all the time as a number one seed because you just don't know. You don't want to be that team that loses. And like now it's like, oh, that's the team that beat the number one seed. And like, I just remember playing, I think, was it my last game? Oh, maybe my junior year. Arizona State at Colonial, and like, it was one of the toughest games you probably played. And it's like, this is just the second round. So like, games like that, it, it really kind of makes you really appreciate and understand that you have to prove why you're the number one seed every single game, no matter what numbers by the other team. And that's, that's the fun part, but also the scary part as well. So you, you spoke about that, that second round game against Arizona State. We were down 11 in the fourth quarter. Yeah. Like down eleven in, yeah. in the fourth quarter. Yeah. And, and and then we we turned on the burners. Uh, we didn't mm -hmm. want to lose. And I what, what's your thought on this? Because this is a hot topic out there too. Like I'm I'm seeing coaches post about um our tournament should move to neutral sites instead of giving host teams an opportunity to, to host the first and second rounds. What's your thoughts on it? I say keep it home. I, I love it. I love that advantage. I think that's what you work for. That's what you're going after. And especially, like, I think about seniors when it's your last go around. Like, nothing's better than winning and moving on from, like, your last game is a win for sure because you want to get to the next level. So I love it. And it gets people in the seats. Um, and I think the cities that they are in, they're cities that people want to kind of go to. Like, I feel like some regional places are not the best because it's like, no knock to the city, but you got to make it more welcoming for people to come and enjoy our game because, like, we was in Stockton. I was like, wait a minute, where are we? Like, <laughs> what are we doing here? So I love it. I love the whole home court advantage. I say keep it, but I don't really have a dog in that fight. <laughs> you, and, and, and I don't know if we all, any of us have a dog in a fight, but I will say this. I've been on the, I've been on both sides of going to someone's home, home court yeah. Uh, when we had when we were just a lower seed um, to now hosting, and I I feel like uh, I feel like teams deserve if you earn mm -hmm. the opportunity to host. That means mm -hmm. your your complete body of work. Yeah. Your complete body of work says that you're a top sixteen team in the country. 
I do feel like you should host. I think a lot of coaches who 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 have to go to those host uh cities, those host uh programs, they've yeah. never hosted before. Right. So when you've never hosted before, you're gonna right. think it's it's an unfair advantage to to the host. And I say, I say, elevate, elevate. That's, that's what we did. That's what we did. Yes. When we had to go to Purdue, were you there? You weren't even there. You, you weren't even there. We had to go to Purdue and play Purdue on their home court, and we won and advanced to the Sweet 16. That was that was super gratifying. Yeah. Um, and if you look at what's happening in this year's tournament, Baylor was hosting and they got upset. Iowa was hosting Iowa, and they yes. got upset. I, I think our game, the parity in our, our game is such that we can handle top 16 teams hosting because of what mm-hmm. you're seeing what's happening in our tournament. I was, yeah. you know, I was very happy that we were able to uh, secure our first and second rounds. And now we, we head into the sweet 16 Asia, what advice would you give to, to our team as they prepare for the sweet 16? Um, I would just say, don't look too far ahead. I think sometimes in college, uh, when we would make it to the regional uh, sweet 16, I'll be like, okay, final four. Yes. Final four. Like, I'm like, I think I can see it. And it's just like that lost my sophomore year in South Dakota. I was looking so far ahead because I came off of a freshman year going to the final four that I really missed the opportunity that I was in. And I think sometimes you get caught up in the commercials and other back brackets and different stuff like that. But I would honestly say just stay in the moment, like stay in the seat 16 until you know that you secured it and then stay in, stay in the elite eight. Like that's when you can start looking once you win that. But right now, don't look too far ahead because you'll get knocked on your behind and it's not a good feeling. <laughs> Yep, guard it, guard it, and, 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 and enjoy the journey. Like, I think yes. I think our team has been, we, our team has been the number one team from start to finish. And then you go into these tournaments, and you know everybody, not everybody, a lot of people project us as as winning a national championship. And um, I mean that's more pressure, but there's right. there's not the pressure that we already put on ourselves to perform. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited for our team. I'm super excited that we get the chance to experience our, our eighth in a row, like yeah. our eighth, <laughs> our eighth in a row. That means that we started sweet 16 before you got to South Carolina. So, you know, yeah. I know you, I know you made us into a powerhouse, but we were doing big yeah. things before you came. Hey, that's we, what I we that's, ele- what I we, that's right. We elevate, we were elevating for you. So. We can make it look like That's you know we're, you were we're the top program team. was like going up, and I was just like, oh, I gotta be a part of this. Like, I want this. So yes, yeah, that's <laughs> why I did. Um, all right, we 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 talk a lot about equity in college sports, yeah. especially after last year's uh, debacle. This year, the women's tournament finally has the March Madness branding. It finally has sixty-eight teams. The officials are receiving the same pay as the men's. And it's been reported that the swag bags are the same as well. Has it felt like a new tournament? Do you think these these tangible steps towards genuine equality and equity are, are good for our sport? And before you answer that, Asia, before you answer that, and I know you probably are not as close to it as you know, as we are, I'm I'm hearing your name on commercials. I know. Like I, I'm seeing your face on commercials, I and I think that's super, super cool, and it's elevating our game. But let talk a little bit about the inequities and what you heard and from yeah. the players, because some of them, you know, some of them are still your teammates from yeah, when you were yeah, in schools. Yeah. Like, what, what, what did you hear, and what do you see um, the changes that have been made, and, and do you think it's helping? Yeah, I think the biggest change that I've seen is like literally being seen. And I think that's why it's heading in the right path of growing our game in the equity of it all. Because I remember before it was literally like completely separate tournaments. Like it was just like one day you had this and the next day it was just like completely separate. But I think this year you're really starting to see just, it'll be all day of basketball. Like you constantly just see it. You see it, you see the women, you see, of course, myself, the DT and the commercials. So I think that's kind of like 
a big step with me because I, even when it comes to our league, it's like if we're seen, that's how you get people involved and locked in. Even when it comes to little the QR code, the scanning brackets, it used to be just men. Now it's like, here's the women and men, and it gets people locked in. Now, I don't know about the swag bags and stuff like that. I haven't heard anything, but I'm pretty sure it's the same, and I'm glad it is the same. But at the end of the day, I think the mayor, of course, we have a lot more work to do, but I think this is a step in the right direction of just being seen, putting these women out here, telling these women's stories is so key to me. You know, speaking of the swag bags, I um, I got a chance to to talk to some of the um, the young ladies on the Howard uh, women's basketball team when they were here, and they actually, they talked about, and I also got a chance to talk to the incarnate word um, team as well. Um, I actually had an opportunity to take pictures with them at the statue. Oh, that's like, so it's, dope. It's, 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 it's cool. Like I, 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 I forget, like I forget that, that people look at South Carolina as some people look at South Carolina as the Mecca of women's basketball, just because they see the crowds that we draw. Yeah. And now, now the statue is a is a draw. Like oh, wow. a, a, every team that comes through here usually stops and takes a picture with the statue. And I, you know, I forgot about that. But then I'm just like, how 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 powerful mm -hmm. is it that y young people talk about South Carolina in that vein, and also they get a chance to, you know, they get a chance to take pictures with yeah. and want to take pictures with your statue. What what do you think your your impact is? Um, when it comes to the statue and what it means to you? I honestly, like, it, it sometimes it slips my mind, I guess, because I'm not in South Carolina as, as, as much, but it's just really crazy just to have something that people can just tweet at me or Instagram. Like, I feel like every day someone's showing me a picture of the statue, and I think it's pretty cool that when people are talking about the state of South Carolina, they're like, that women's basketball program is off the charts. And I think it's pretty cool just to be a part of that legacy um, the people to come and be a part of. Because like you said, I think I, I think we don't understand. The people look at South Carolina and it's like, whoa, like they really bring a good crowd. They're good people. Like, and I guess because I'm, I lived it and I'm in it, I'm like, oh yeah, it's just my, it's just my school, like whatever. But it's, it's really, really nice to see like the basketball community just embrace us uh, as South Carolina's women's basketball program. Because I mean, you worked hard to get us to where we are now. So everything, like, it, I feel like we deserve it. And I'm glad to see it just because that's, like, that's the home. That's the backyard. Super cool. Yeah. Now, now, Asia, who in this tournament are you hoping to get drafted so you can either team up with or play against next season? Hmm. I mean, <laughs> my favorites are juniors. <laughs> um, okay. <seniors. laughs> um, All right, how about I'm, this? How about this? How about this? How about this? Who do you think is going to be the number one draft pick? Ooh. Putting you I got to say Ryan Howard. I got to say Ryan Howard. Why like, do you think, why you think Ryan over Nalissa? Because, like, I guess just thinking about the team that she's getting drafted to, I think she'll fit right in. Like, her, her speed and her IQ is, like, really there and really good for them. So, I think Ryan Howard, but I'm just, I don't know. Okay. All right. How about this? I, I, know, I know you're not scared of anyone. No. But who would you least want to play against at the next level? From this tournament? From this tournament. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to give out buckets to everybody. <laughs> I'm trying to give out buckets to everybody, so like. Okay, well, well answer this question. Who, like, I know y'all at the next level, y'all in the analytics and all of that. Like, what team do you bomb against all the time? Ooh, yeah, yeah. Indiana. Ooh, really? Indiana. Indiana. Wow. I don't Indiana. Them my, no, I them said, I, no, listen, listen, listen. I, I didn't say you the bomb against. I said who you bomb against. Like, don't oh, like play doo -doo. well. Doodoo, -doo, right. yes. Like, 
Yes. Ooh, Connecticut. I, I have not had a good name in Connecticut my whole career. And I'm a year five. At Connecticut, at Vegas, it don't matter. Age is stinking it up. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, it's just weird. Like, and then we go up there and we're there for like a week or something because we're on a road trip. And it's <laughs> tough. Like, their fans are all involved. It's like orange all the time. It, don't get me wrong. They got a nice little fan base, too. But stinky? Come. <laughs> Come. That's the first game I look at when we, I'm like, let me go there. <laughs> let me get my mom. <laughs> you see that that that's that's some inside stuff there because you know at yeah. the at the next level they have so many y'all got access to so many different analytics that you know you know you see your stats you see your shooting yeah. percentage you see yeah. um you you don't think it's the length of uh John Quill Jones though it very well could <laughs> and Duana they be tearing my heart oh, right. up I was like dang I can't get Nothing off. <laughs> oh, Lord. That's everything. But it's cool. I get it. I get the scout. I got the scout now, you know, year five. That's a really contract, you know? I got to oh, get my got, scout again. Well, we finishing up now, 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 Asia. Tell us, tell us seriously, like, tell the people when you are in your, in your rookie contract. Yeah. Right? Like you were playing your, in your last year of your rookie contract into you know, your next level contract, what what goes through your mind when it comes to, you know, wanting the big bucks and, and performing that way to receive that? What what was your thought process? I know what it was because I used to talk to you a little bit. But 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 tell the people that that tell the tell the, the rookies that's coming in as yeah. well as as well as some of the younger players who are in year four. Yeah of their contract or year three. What is it? Y'all got four years and a plus one or three plus, four. plus one. Yeah, three and a plus one. Normally the team asks you back. So four. So four. So, so tell us what was your mindset? I mean, going into my fourth year, I was like, I'm trying to get paid. Like at the end of the day, I'm trying to get paid. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to not get out of my way and of who I am as a player. But I got to get to that contract. And then even then, I was thinking about getting to the next one. Because I feel like I don't want to get so caught up in this one that I'm like, all right, I still have to improve my game and work towards so I can get another contract and a contract after that. But it wasn't fun. It wasn't. Because, like, you know, when the numbers come out and you see that someone that's entered in the league after you is making more than you and you're a number one draft pick, like, that there is kind of like, Mm-hmm. Okay, but it makes you want to grind even more. Like I was just like, I gotta get out of this contract. I just remember saying that to myself every day. I'm like, I gotta get out of this contract. So I really would do anything and everything I could to make sure that I perform well, not only for the contract, but for my team and myself as well. And it's hard. It's really, really hard, especially just our league is getting bigger, faster, and stronger uh, by the draft class. So you know, you just gotta focus on your game and make sure that you put in that work. When them lights cut on, you gotta perform and get paid. Well, well, Asia, this is super cool. I, I really enjoy having you on on Net Life, and you know I'm always pulling for you, and I'm always pulling for all of my former players. Um, but certainly, I'm super happy for your success. I know that there are more MVP trophies coming your way. I know you've been working on your handle, and I know you've been working on your three-point shot. Y'all got a new coach. Hey, Becky Hammond, if you're listening out there, free Asia, let her shoot those threes. Free Asia's threes. Free them up. Pick and pop for three, 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 three. You know what? I already got my celebration now. Before we get to my interview with President Pastides, we need to take a quick break to hear from one of NetLife's partners. As I'm sure you've heard in previous episodes, we've been sharing clips from an amazing podcast called Flame Bears, where we hear from incredible women Olympians and Paralympians about their journeys to the games, but also gain insight to their personal lives and explore matters that are close to their heart. Listen to this clip of the episode with Mahela Hogaz, where we hear about how important her family is to her 
and how her sister has been a role model throughout her life. I think that for me, it was important, the education from my parents. Of course, I worked a lot, but I think that right now when I, I'm looking at other people, I think that, yeah, my education was very good and very important for who I am right now. And also I have a sister, a big sister. He's uh, five years older than me and she has a baby. Oh, your nephew. Yeah, but I love him like he, he's mine. So, are you close with your sister? What was your yes. dynamic growing up? I think that because I was younger, I just wanted to be like her, and I wanted to go everywhere she would go. So, I, I'm I'm sure that I was an annoying sister, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I just <laughs> wanted to be her, and I I remember that many. In many exams and things, I was saying that I want to be like my sister because she was also into sport. Mahela values her family's support, and with them by her side, she has become the fastest female Romanian speed skater in the world. Listen to the rest of her episode on Flame Bears, wherever you get your podcasts. The Beijing Paralympics are finally here. While you watch as athletes compete, hear their stories. Listen to top women athletes share their trials and triumphs on the Flame Bears podcast. Stay tuned for more and what's ahead on Flame Bears season two. What's the best workout program? The one that is custom built just for you. Future is the new workout experience that pairs you one-on-one -on -one with your own fitness coach. Your coach will map out a plan based on your goals with workouts delivered to your phone each week. Future, your Apple Watch and the app all pair seamlessly so you and your coach can track your progress, celebrate achievements, and keep you accountable every day. Get started right now with 50% off your first three months at tryfuture.com slash netlife. I have a very distinguished guest this week. The University of South Carolina President Harris Pestides was initially president of the university from 2008 to 2019 and returned to the role in May of 2021. Under President Pestides' guidance, the USC system saw unprecedented growth both academically and record fundraising. It would take an entire podcast for me to name the awards and the honors that President Pastides has earned, including his prior career as an epidemiologist. President Pastides, thank you for joining NetLife. So honored to be with you. Uh, your podcast is uh, interesting and exciting, and uh, it's actually humbling. Uh, to know that you had President Bill Clinton as a guest, uh, and then I get to uh, to be interviewed by you too. So real joy to be with you today. We we share something in common with President Clinton. Our 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 baseball collection. Our baseball collection. Actually, I started my baseball collection because of um, coming to your office and bringing our our recruits and parents to your office, and we saw your I saw your collection. I was like, that's that's a pretty neat idea idea to do and 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 it's grown it's grown over the over the years so I you know I, I thank you for allowing me to to start that collection <clears throat> absolutely and I'll just interject that I have uh, about 150 uh, look basketballs are too big Man, you know, they are <laughs> it's not gonna let me keep 150 balls in my man <laughs> cave or wherever. Uh, and, uh, you know, and athletics unifies people. And people ask me, why'd you pick? You know, you could have had an autograph on a piece of paper or a book. And I said, no, when, when you see an individual hold a baseball, they get uh, sentimental about it. They, they don't know where to sign. They turn it over. And uh, it's the same with you, Don. Uh, most of my signees are not athletes. I do have some wonderful athletes but most of them are people from other walks of life. So it's a great unifier. Absolutely. Um, 
At what point did you realize you wanted to spend your career in education? Well, I was, uh, uh, I was pre-med. Uh, I, I grew up in the days where my family said, look, you do whatever you want to do, but it, it's hard providing for a family. Choose a career that is uh, you know, going to allow you to do that. And uh, so I was pre-med, but I was also very involved politically in uh, a Vietnam War protest, uh, uh, civil rights. Uh, my, my father took us to see uh, Martin Luther King Jr. in New York City. Uh, uh, by the way, I've, I've gone back and looked at it one year to the day before he was assassinated in, in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, so I was very involved politically. I learned about public health and I got off the track of pre-med, got into public health. And then within that, again, because I, I love young people, I decided to want to be a professor, went to University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, and then to South Carolina. So I've never looked back. I would say I'm a little uh, boring. I've only worked in universities. I've never worked uh, any other place in, uh, you know, any other kind of place, but I, I wouldn't trade it. I, I'd go back and do it the same way. That's awesome, uh, President Pestides. What Was there a specific moment when you realized you wanted to transition from being a professor to being a, an academic administrator? Well, uh, it, it, yeah, it wasn't that I wanted to. Back at UMass, I was, uh, my dean came to me, I was a professor, and he said, we need a new department chair. And I, and I said, yeah, we really do. We really do. And he said, and it ought to be you. And I said, you are kidding, because I love what I do, and there's no way I'm going to the dark side. And he said, well, then stop complaining. So I went from dean to vice president for research and then elected president in 2008. It just kind of just kind of happened with a lot of great people behind me and and ahead of me, too. Yeah. So so the, the recruiting process, uh, how was that? W would it would it be something very similar to, you know, I know you, you know, you see, I mean, you, you have not turned one of our um, prospects or parents down. Was it very similar to, to that process for you? Yes, uh, probably maybe a little less structured, but uh, you know, I was recruited by the provost to be a dean. Uh, he got to know my interests and my kids' interests, so got me tickets to Columbia City Ballet, uh, took us around town, knew we liked uh, Thai food and went out of his way to, a, you know, so th there was that little part of whining and dining uh, but for me, I will tell you, um, uh, I walked on the horseshoe one day going to my first appointment and a young uh, man um, who was playing Frisbee there, Frisbee uh, flew, flew by and I, I picked it up and, uh, and uh, sent it back and he kept running to me and I thought I had done something wrong, but he just wanted to say thank you. He said, thank you, uh, sir. And I said, wow people are different here than they are in New York City, you know? And, uh, and the more I got to know the place, the more I did love it. And so I have really had a love affair, a, a romance, if you will, with the university, with the people, uh, as I know you have too. Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, when I, when I first got down here, I, I, I didn't recruit the players that were here and they would, they would always, answer me yes ma'am no ma'am and I'm looking around when they say that like where's the ma'am <laughs> where's the where's, where's the ma'am <laughs> but I mean it's the you know it's the the southern comfort the you know the respect yeah. I, I've uh you know anytime I hear ma'am down I'm just I'm looking up like you are you talking to me now <laughs> and, so and, I think that's <laughs> and, I think that's super cool about being in the south that and, and growing up in the city you just it's it's a it's a lot different living, but I mean it is you know it, it's comfortable. Like it, they make you really really comfortable being here. They do, they do, and you know up in Philly and New York, people are friendly there too. People miss from here misunderstand, but those are not unfriendly places. <laughs> <laughs> They're just not as courteous maybe, and and but if you're in a jam. Uh, oh, New Yorkers and people in Fed, they're just as friendly ultimately, but they're, they're a little harder on the outside. I do want to say, though, thank you for allowing me to participate in the recruitment of your players. 
uh, uh, I don't know if it's everyone, but there are cer certainly still players on your team now who uh, came to me. Uh, I remember, uh, I remember Leah, I remember Zaya, uh, who came often with their families uh, and uh, Asia, I remember so many of them, not only them, but many, many, many players. And, you know, they would sit in my conference room, sometimes with you, sometimes with Coach Boyer, sometimes with another coach, sometimes with Coach McRae in the past. And I would say, look, I cannot talk to you about basketball here, not my job, but I want to tell you that I care about your uh, progress as a student. We don't say you're an athlete student. We say you're a student athlete. Why do we go out of alphabetical order? Because that's why you're ultimately here. We want you to graduate, graduate on time. We'll support you. But I care about your career, about your major, where you want to be someday. If it's not the WNBA, if it is, talk to Don. If it's about being a, a banker, a lawyer, a doctor, a nurse, a professor, talk to me now. And uh, I don't know if the students really loved that. They were seemed a little quiet sometimes, but the parents really loved that. And then we would talk about Patricia or she would attend and she would say, I care about your eating. I care about your sleeping, your wellness. And so um, that's the thing. This is, not, this is not the WNBA. This is a university. And I think it's a mistake for a, a college player. I don't care how good you are to only look at the women's basketball team. That's where it starts, but you got to look at the whole university and it was a privilege to help you and the other coaches in recruiting. Yeah. So you, you, you and uh, Mrs. Pestides has been, they, you've been a part of uh, the university community since 1998. What, now, now we, we, heard, we heard about the Frisbee. Um, what did Mrs. Pestides think what was her first impression when she when she got down to the Columbia, South Carolina after being up up north? Well, first of all, she was more about the weather than me. I don't really <laughs> care about the weather. I, I'm OK, but she loved the uh, sunshine and loved uh, that feeling of, of springtime when it comes in February and the uh, uh, the pear trees start to blossom. Uh, she also was overwhelmed, I think, by the courtesy and by the a culture of this wonderful university. Uh, she took on her own. Uh, she took on her own interests, and it was health and wellness and cooking. Uh, and by the way, she did that. Her calendar on any given day, Coach, is here's mine. By the way, you don't have to don't have to read it, but that's my today. <laughs> I could hold hers up, and it would be the same exact length <laughs> number of meetings. So sometimes people complain. They say, "Hey, Prez, you get paid a lot of money." I said, I do. I do. But you get two for one uh, because she's got no salary. I got the salary. I divide it with her. And then, by the way, it's about seven days a week and 24 hours a day, because even when I'm sleeping, uh, I'm worried about something. So then they then they lay off and say, OK, OK, we'll give you a break. <laughs> um, you became president in, in 2008. One of your early focuses was increasing enrollment not just at the university, uh, university in Columbia, but also through programs like the Palmetto College, which is an online bachelor's program. Um, why did you think it was important to increase uh, university access? Well, because a college degree is uh, critically important to everybody today. Not everybody can afford to come to a four-year residential college, which I think is wonderful the right way to do it if it can be afforded, but why not go meet people where they live? We're, we're about all the people, not, not only the ones who reside on campus. And that's why we started that program called Palmetto College. That's awesome. I know that the cost of, uh, to attend school at, here at South Carolina, anywhere, is a, is a lot for young people. Uh, what, still, what, what still needs to happen to make college more affordable, you know, for, for those who you know, like I'm a, I'm a first generation college graduate. Um, I would not have gone to college if if I didn't was I wasn't able to dribble the basketball, put it in a hole, pass it at a really high level. Um, so, wh how, what are some of the things that need to happen to, to give you know people in that are in dire need of an education um, to 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 afford to go to, to school? 
Right. Well, it's got to be seen as a public good. First of all, let me say we, we've got to do better to restrain cost and escalating cost of college. Uh, some people complain, complain about the lazy river pools that we have and the incredible dormitories like at 650 Lincoln. And, uh, uh, but beyond that, we need more need-based aid. South Carolina is a good example of a state that provides a fair amount of uh, assistance to its state residents, but it's merit-based. So if you graduate from a South Carolina high school with, uh, with good grades, you're gonna get a lottery funded scholarship. Uh, but often that's not enough for a, uh, a Pell Grant recipient to afford it. So if you wanna go to USC in Columbia, even if your, your way is paid completely through, uh, through the lottery program, probably costs about $10,000 a year between, uh, between a dorm, food, books, transportation, and the other things that one needs. Now, $10,000 is a lot of money for a lot of families. And so we're, uh, uh, this year, uh, we've gone to our General Assembly, to our legislators, and said, please, please, please put more money into need-based aid. Uh, so those students who were Pell recipients, because that is still keeping, away from, uh, keeping people away from college, um, but it's got to be seen as a public good. If it's seen as a luxury, people, people are, you know, governments are going to pave the road and uh, build bridges, but they're not going to uh, support public higher ed. So that's what we advocate for. I'm excited to share more about Flame Bearers, one of my new favorite podcasts on Flame Bearers, top women Olympic and Paralympic athletes from around the world like USA Soccer's Becky Sauerbrunn and Nigerian hoop star Azene Kalu Phelps share their rarely heard stories and their full selves. Hear directly from the masters of grit and resilient to learn more about the issues that matter most to them and how they've been able to overcome obstacle after obstacle. Season two is live now and Flame Bearers is spotlighting the women athletes blazing a trail to Beijing including U.S. figure skater Brady Tennell, ROC's Oksana Abdekarmanmova, and many more. When you watch them compete in February and March, you'll see what they've worked so hard to achieve. But first, hear from them what happens when the cameras are off and stadiums are silent. During these challenging times, these women are an endless source of hope and inspiration. Our next partner has a product I use literally every day. In just a few short weeks of adding Athletic Greens to my daily routine, I was fully bought into the hype. Before Athletic Greens, I felt like I had to take so many different supplements to just get the daily nutrition I needed. It was hard to create and sustain any kind of routine, especially how much I'm on the move. Now, I have my bag at home and take my travel packs on the go. No matter where I am, I shake it up, drink it first thing in the morning, and start my day the right way. Right now, it's time to prioritize your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. I love the peace of mind it gives me. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash net. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash N-E-T to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. What's the best workout program? the one that is custom built just for you. Future is the new workout experience that pairs you one-on-one -on -one with your own fitness coach. Your coach will map out a plan based on your goals with workouts delivered to your phone each week. Future, your Apple Watch and the app all pair seamlessly so you and your coach can track your progress, celebrate achievements, and keep you accountable every day. Get started right now 
with 50% off your first three months at tryfuture.com slash netlife. Have you ever heard of recovery footwear or active recovery? I had neither until a fellow coach gifted me a pair of UFOs. And let me tell you, they have become my habit. I keep a pair everywhere, at home, in my office, in my locker, everywhere. As a former athlete, I still work out. It's tough to turn that off, but I also have to get my boy champ his exercise. And of course, coaching is super active. So I'm constantly on the move. My UFOs help me feel so much better throughout the day, no matter how much I have going on. UFOs uses a unique foam material called UFOM TM that absorbs impact so your body doesn't have to. You know, the journey that leads you to success is filled with adversity that can knock you off your path. But the resilience to sustain that success starts with active recovery and UFOs. Check out all the different styles, each with the same foam technology and footbed on UFOs.com. They changed my life and I think they could do the same for you. Osa mimosas are a drink I recently discovered. Their canned mimosas come in four delicious flavors like classic orange, peach bellini, mango, and my personal favorite, cranberry mimosa. They're made with premium sparkling wine, 100% real fruit juice, and contain 80% less sugar and 60% fewer calories than typical mimosas. But the best part is they're always ready to go, which means zero prep and most importantly, zero mess. Right now, Osa is partnering with NetLife to give our listeners a free four-pack of their best-selling classic mimosas with any purchase over $29. Simply add items to your cart and they'll automatically add a free four-pack to your order once your cart reaches $29 or more. Do yourself a favor and grab some delicious mimosas at osamimosas.com slash JWS. That's O-H-Z-A mimosas.com slash J-W-S. You also were in charge of a record-setting billion-dollar fundraising campaign while you were president here. Um, Getting people to buy into your vision of what the university could be obviously required a lot of charisma and leadership. What was your message to get those donors and alums to open their wallets to you? Well, Patricia had the charisma, so, (laughs) uh, and we took almost every visit together. Uh, And uh, my philosophy is you can't raise a dollar without raising a friend. I almost never talked on about money in an early meeting, uh, always later on. Uh, I could remember, I'll just mention one person, she's a friend of ours, both Lou Kennedy, who uh, uh, you know, visited her in Orlando, visited her again, called on the phone, uh, she and Bill. And uh, eventually, though, eventually, though, you got to make the ask. Uh, and when I did, um, it was uh, her response was, well, it's not how much you hoped for. And I said to myself, OK, please, please, I hope it's like three quarters of it. I said to myself, <laughs> and she said, it's actually more than you asked for. And she said, you work with us and we're going to do something greater than you imagined. And, uh, and that fuels the fire for the next uh, ask. And, uh, and then you keep going. But I, I never viewed it. I'd be a very bad vacuum cleaner salesperson <laughs> uh, because it's not what turns me on. But if I'm raising money for uh, need-based scholarships and faculty support, I could uh, I'd do that because I believe in it. And just tell the story. People like stories. They don't like, you know, big, big, big reports with, uh, you know, a lot of graphs and, and things, things like that. They just want to know how their money's going to help. And when you do that and uh, or put a student in front of them. Uh, but I will say athletics is a great lubricant. It is because when people um, people want to be around good people and they want to be around good young people and good coaches and they want to be around winning. I'd, I'd love to say winning doesn't matter, but it does matter. And I don't believe uh, we could have raised a billion dollars. By the way, the most money that had ever been raised in South Carolina by any institution in history, if uh, you and your team 
and football and uh, softball as we were moving up uh, if we weren't doing well. And when you, uh, people want to be with a winner, that's just the way it is. And, and that, that's why and how we concluded that, that campaign. Um, I, I, I just would like to just add this as, um, I just have to say it because of who you are as, I know you're the, the president of our university um, you are a leader amongst leaders. I mean, you've always had held that position. Um, and I'm just going to give them a, a little story about uh, when my alma mater came after me. Um, the University of Virginia, um, they, they had an interest in hiring me, Carla Williams. We had her on the podcast as well. And, <clears throat> and, I mean, it was hard. It was, it was it was hard having that discussion with her and then coming back and telling Ray Tanner, I just needed a weekend to think about it. And then you called. You called before the weekend. And you just explained, like, you know, how much, how much you appreciate me and how much being here and the impact that I've had on this community and this university. And then, <laughs> and then you said this. You said... If you have to go to Virginia, I understand because, you know, it's family. It's, you know, it's where you, where you found yourself. And then you add, added one more thing. And you said, well, did, you said, did Ray offer you anything? You said, I, I'm not talking rugs and furniture, <laughs> right? You said, I'm talking, you know, monetarily. And I, and I said, no, but it, it really wasn't about that because it, you know, I'm very much like you. It's it's a feeling. It's you know, money isn't the in all. Money isn't like the the thing that pulls you in. It's more of the friendships and the relationships that you you've built. Um, but you said um, I'm gonna give you this number, and I want you to call this person because I want I I want if you decide to stay here to extend um, this to you. And it was. It was information about a a split dollar policy, um, and you know a split dollar policy. You know, quite frankly, in a in a nutshell, it is it's it's basically generational wealth. Um, you guys that are listening, you look it up. You find you know it's intriguing reads, um, but I I actually had to tell Virginia no for no other reason uh, besides what we built here in South Carolina. I find myself in a community that accepts me, that that has allowed me to just peel back my layers and and become more more like them. Like I I I I'm I'm not that Philly girl that I used to be as far as uh, moving in a big city. I've I've come to enjoy the slower pace. Um, I've come to enjoy the people um, that make up this this university, this state, this city, and it's it's a it, it was hard telling Virginia no, um, but when you think about what we've built here and think about all the relationships that I that I have here, um, it 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 made it a little bit easy to say no because of because of all the people here. But I I just thank you uh, for putting me in a position to have generational wealth for for my for my siblings and my family members that, that, you know, and my family members that will, will enjoy the fruits of my labor here at South Carolina. And it would not have happened without you extending that to me. So I want, I want to say thank you. All university presidents um, should get involved with everything that a university um, has to offer. Women's basketball is an afterthought in, on most campuses, um, but you put it in the forefront. And I, I truly believe that our success is because of your leadership, your ability to allow us to grow and learn and, 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 and feel like a sport on our campus. You were just you were just at our SEC tournament uh, this weekend. You brought some donors. You brought some – I mean, you brought a lot of people. And I think you're just a, a, a forward thinker when it comes to leadership and there are opportunities to raise the level of our, our university through sports, and you utilize women's basketball in that way. So I know I was a little long-winded, but 
it, it's, it's much deserved. So I just want to just give you your flowers um, because you've been giving me my flowers for as long as you've been president here at the University of South Carolina. Well, look, I know how this happened here, but I got this beautiful little card of flowers here. I'm giving <laughs> you some. First of all, let me say that um, I did that for you because someone did it for me. And you may not know this, but a couple of years before that, I, I was in a similar situation of going to another good school uh, that also pulled on my heartstrings. But that uh, split dollar plan, by the way, you're right. You and I will probably never see that money. It really not. It's really long term. It's, uh, you know, we get a raise, we see the money. You, you do that plan and it's really about uh, when we pass and uh, there'll be money for other people, people we care about, generational wealth. But I also wanna say, Dawn, that uh, keeping you uh, truly is more about, more than about women's basketball. Uh, we in this country have a, a gender equity issue. We have a lot of equity issues. Of course we do racial equity and uh, poverty and class equity, but uh, you are beginning, you're not done with that. And I want to be part of your team. I want to do more. And when I think of you, I don't want to say I wear a wristband that says WWDD, what would Don do? But I, <laughs> uh, but I do think about that. And uh, uh, when you uh, agreed to stay on and, and you signed your last contract with us, uh, you told me very specifically this time, it wasn't about generational wealth, but it was about, uh, about equity and justice for women coaches, white and black, uh, around the country. And uh, it's time. Uh, I know your impact, by the way, and therefore our impact, because I, I get referred credit. Uh, I was with uh, um, the uh, NCAA uh, uh, president, Mark Emmert, at the tournament, by the way, this weekend. And, and we talked about in the past, um, you know, the men's final four would have been here and, uh, you know, the locations would have been Madison Square Garden and we flew out to see you in Stockton, California. And I'm not down to people of Stockton, I love you, but <laughs> it wasn't the same thing. And then we'd go to Tampa and the amenities weren't there. And, I, you know, it's like, excuse me, you got college athletes competing. Why, why not? give them similar things. And, and so uh, the struggle is a long way from over, but you are a, uh, if I may borrow from Congressman John Lewis, uh, a foot soldier in, in the struggle. We, we're not anywhere yet, but uh, you, you talked recently, I saw something you taped about uh, the inequity in retirement, uh, in retirement uh, wealth for women and men. And again, do, do women need less money in retirement? I don't think so. I think, I think not. So anyway, thank you for that kindness to me. But I, I did that with you and for you because someone had treated me that way. And now you're paying it forward and there'll be other people who come, uh, come after you, who follow you, who will benefit because of, of the things you did too. So thank you for that. Thank you. And, and while we're at it, you did, you did mention about... Um, you know my my new contract. You were you were very instrumental in in getting that done. I mean, you know, we I know you had conversation with uh, uh my 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 lawyer Butch Bowers and um, Butch told me um, when he had his first conversation with you, he said we will get it done. And I know there was a lot more negotiations before and after that, um, but. You, were re you reassured him that we would get it done. And I, I did rest easy um, when you did get involved in the, the negotiations. Not, you didn't get involved very much. You, you, were, you were there as president and it, you were a conversation and you, you allowed everyone to do their jobs in it. But when, when it comes from the top, when it comes from the leader of the university, you feel real good about um, make it, you feel good about it. It's going to get done and it's going to get done for the right reason. So I, I, again, I, I thank you again. And I just employ all other university presidents to really get involved with things that are happening on campus because you, uh, you, you have impact, you have impact and you know, there isn't a bigger, I, I I'm going to just, just be selfish. I don't know if there's a, another person here at this university that has, um, has, impacted my life in the way that, that you have. And I, I really appreciate that. You're not just 
saying things. You're at our games. You, you visit our parents and our, our, our prospective student athletes. Um, you're a part of um, contract negotiations, um, not, you know, not just football, men's basketball, soccer. You're a part of everyone's um, negotiations, and I really appreciate you doing that. And I know we got off a little bit, but I, I got to talk to talk to you a little bit about um, just what what are the biggest challenges uh, you've seen in university life during your presidency, and what was it that keeps you up at night um, that occurs um, on campus when you're responsible for I don't know what we got thirty thousand thirty five thousand students here on campus. We have 37,500 in Columbia, but we have 50,000 across. <laughs> That's a lot of people. Uh, I, I uh, first of all, the pandemic can't be, uh, uh, you can't overestimate the impact of that. Uh, but the worst part, and by the way, yes, the people who died, the people who got sick, um, you know, amazing, millions of Americans. But I'll tell you there, I worry about the lasting effect of the social estrangement uh, caused by COVID, the isolation of people, the, you know, the uh, epidemic of mental health issues. And it's not only with students, staff have it, faculty have it, we all have it. Uh, I recently uh, did a, uh, you know, some, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about mental health among young people. And they said, President Pastides, if you could ever tell a story about some time when you had a problem, uh, maybe weren't sure you could make it and how you overcame that. And so I'm, I do a lot of that lately. So the pandemic has created, uh, uh, you know, uh, some frayed edges uh, with the faculty, with students. Uh, we've got to work hard. We're not back. Let, let just be clear. We might take the masks off uh, and we will, but that is not enough. We, you know, we've lost, uh, um, you know, that closeness, that intimacy between people. I worry about that. Uh, we talked about the expense of college. I worry a great deal about that. Uh, I worry about the things that happen uh, across the nation and how that uh, we're not, you know, we got a brick wall for people who don't know. We do have a brick wall around the core part of the campus, but we're not apart from the world. You know, the George Floyd murder and I could talk about many others, but that changed the world uh, for the better. Uh, not, I'm not saying it was a good thing that happened, but um, there is a, a fraying of society when, when things happen in, in uh, uh, you know, somewhere around the country, they happen here on campus as well. And, uh, and so you, you've got to develop trust and, and be known for integrity because we can't solve the problems of the world. Right now, we're looking at what we could do for Ukrainian uh, people who, uh, with universities closed, you know, what's gonna happen to the students, to scholars, can we rescue some of them? Can we, you know, I, we're only one university, right? But, but good things happen when one person stands up and says, I wanna help and uh, we'll continue to do that. But, but I will tell you though that I, you talked about being, you know, up at night. As you get older, you do begin to, you, you've seen more. And, and going back to, uh, you know, that, that loss against Kentucky, it's not the first time you coach uh, have been in a game like that or have lost a game like that. You've won many, but you've lost some as well. And for the players, it's, it's newer to them. Uh, but for somebody who's seen a lot, you you turn that into an opportunity to do something better. And I do, too. So I'm truly optimistic about our university going forward. Uh, but I also worry about the fraying of, uh, you know, the fraying of relationships that I've seen. And uh, and that's why when we can be with you in the Colonial Life Arena or um you know, or in Nashville, and you see people just coming together, high-fiving. We were walking down the streets of Nashville and saw Gamecocks who I didn't know, and they were coming up and hugging. And, and so, again, you know, there's that, that spirit. And I think if you're authentic, like you are, Coach, people will, will see that. And, uh, but I'm an eternal optimist. I see the pain and suffering. I ask myself what I can do about it, but I don't worry 
about whether the University of South Carolina will be here 10 years from now or 100 years from now. Awesome. So I, I know we talked a little, about, a little bit about um, athletics um, and, and your role as president on our, on our campus. Um, how do you, just as president, view the role of college sports and contributing to the university environment? Well, it's much more than about money. I can tell you that it, it is, uh, first of all, it is about integrity. And when you don't have integrity in athletics, uh, you're in deep trouble. I worry about NIL. Uh, I'm not against it, I'm absolutely for it. Uh, but I worry about the, the forces of, uh, of, those, of those places with money, with deep pockets and uh, will it will it cause uh, a young woman to go to a school where uh, her family might be promised something? Uh, and it's not that money doesn't matter. Of course, it ma matters. But I worry about the darker forces. I worry about gambling. I uh, worry about how many people, uh, how how billions of dollars are being spent betting on college athletics. I, I don't. I'm not approved, by the way. It's not that. Not that. <laughs> It's just that these influences are uh, really, really big, and I worry about where it's going. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I know that um, I called it a lubricant before. I know that uh, athletics is the front porch of, of our university. It's not, it's not more important than the classroom. In fact, let me be direct, it's less important than the classroom. Uh, but it is a front porch. And when people walk by and they're looking at a house, they look at the front porch. Uh, they'd love to know what the kitchen looks like, but that's kind of behind. And so uh, I, I'll also tell you that in, in Europe, uh, intercollegiate athletics or in Asia, it's not like it is here. There is some, there is some, but uh, residential life, intercollegiate athletics, and a liberal arts and sciences core curriculum, those are the three defining things of American higher education. You don't get that in Europe, you don't get that in Asia or in Africa or in the Middle East by and large, um, and that is a defining thing for us. So that, um, so that our uh, FAMs, uh, I tell people, if you come to USC, uh, don't think you're gonna stop you know, supporting us in the future. It's like, uh, it's like, it's like an addiction. And so if you come to Carolina, <laughs> you're addicted with Carolina for the rest of your life. Uh, so I really wouldn't have it any other way. I, I do, I think Title IX was a, a remarkable turning point. Uh, it would have been so easy to cut more. I guarantee you to cut women's athletics at universities. It might've been here or there. It might've been with a golf or a softball or an equestrian pro program or a women's basketball program. And so laws do matter. And uh, federal laws, in fact, do matter. And so, uh, you know, that won't be happening and it certainly won't be happening as easily uh, in the future. President Pestiz, what, what do you think is, would be the happy medium between um, the, the, the name, image and likeness um, issues that are out there? Like, I, I'm a, I'm a believer in it, meaning I, I, want, I want our student athletes to be able to capitalize on their, their name, image, and likeness. But I, but I also see the other side of it, which you just mentioned about, and I think there's gonna be, I mean, there are, are the laws are different state to state. Like, but I do think it's coming down the pipeline where um, they're gonna allow us to be able to, um, talk um, broker deals for our, for our players like like university personnel is going to be able to to be involved in brokering deals and I know you just mentioned this but what is, what is the happy medium that you know we can you know we can just do our jobs as coaches um, and then a student athlete can do their jobs and they can get their agents and the agents can can do their jobs in, in finding suitable um, sponsorships and deals for for their for their clients. I I really don't want any parts of it. Like I don't. I want to be able to just coach our team. But I know that if this thing opens up, yes. you know, I've added another job. I've added another title to my, you know, to my to my job description. 
Right. Well, let me put it this way. It's, it's over, overly simplistic, but I was talking to our athletic director, Ray Tanner, the other day about it. Just like I'll, I'll draw from bowling. So bowling, you know, you have a fairly narrow lane and you have two gutters on the side. I think uh, name, image uh, and likeness, the uh, court cases and the uh, engagement of other people mean we have to broaden, widen the lane, but not give up on the gutters. So if you just say it's just throw the ball, no gutters, that's a, that's a free for all. That's the wild west. We can't have that. We need to, but whether we're doubling the, the, the width of the lane, are we tripling it? I don't know that, but there's got to be a gutter on the left and a gutter on the right and things that are sleazy, things that are, that lack integrity, things that make one of your players rich and the rest of them get nothing, not good. And so I think it's all going to filter out. I think, I think it's going to be a multi-year journey to find that place, that medium, I think you called it. We're not there yet. Uh, but, but certainly the laws have changed. And so it's not the way it was either anymore. And I think most people agree that's a good thing. But where it's going to go, I hope we didn't create a monster that's worse than what we had before but it's going to take a lot of people with integrity like you. I know you don't want another job, but we do need you uh, and other wise voices to weigh in because you're closer to where the women on your team live with respect to financial uh, ability. And uh, the other thing I want to say is we're, we're not, I don't want us to be a minor league for, we are, we are a developmental league. Of course we are for the WNBA and, uh, for baseball, of course we are, but I, I, I don't want us to be uh, to lose sight that when we offer a, a college degree, we're doing something that is a way more important. Uh, I never minded hearing about those NBA players uh, who went from high school to the NBA. More power to you. If you're not into your degree, you should be allowed to do that. Uh, and, and we know we know many of those people and they had phenomenal careers, uh, but that's not what I want college to be about. I know a lot of people talk about one and done, which is a men's basketball issue, not a women's. Uh, you know, I think one and I then I, by the way, Coach Cal and I go way back from our days at UMass. So again, let me say intense respect for him. Uh, uh, having said that, is one year of college uh, enough? Uh, I, I think that when you talk about two or three years of college, you're close enough that someday you come back and finish your degree online. I worry sometimes that one year is not enough. But anyway, uh, NIL is here to stay. I see nothing that's going to challenge that. It's just a matter of is it, is it going to be a positive force or a negative force? Uh, we, those of us who care deeply about student athlete well-being need to uh, assure uh, and work with, uh, with the nation to make sure it, it gets to a better place. Well, thank you. Well, President Pastides, we do something on, on, on NetLife. It's called the NetLife Shot Clock. Um, so I can't let you go without having a little bit of fun. This is what we're going to do. We're going to put 20 seconds on the clock, and you answer as many questions as you can. OK. All right? I'm ready. If you weren't working in education, what would you be doing? I'd like to be a chef, professional chef. Wow, okay. What is your favorite South Carolina tradition? Um, I love uh, Darius Rucker or Hootie and the Blowfish uh, playing a concert on the horseshoe, and we're going to ask them to do that again. <laughs> okay. What is your favorite South Carolina dish? Um, I would, uh, I would probably like to say, uh, fried, uh, fried pork chops. I'm okay. going to go with that mashed potatoes and gravy. <laughs> okay. What's your favorite city in Greece? I'm going to go to the small cycladic island called Paros, P-A-R-O-S. It's not as crazy as Mykonos. Maybe not as scenic as Santorini, but it's my favorite. Would love to take you there someday. I would love that. And last question, who has been the biggest role model in your life? Well, um, I, I would probably have to say um, um, uh, a former uh, professor of mine, 
uh, she passed away this year, um, uh, a woman named uh, Jenny Kelsey. Uh, and I, too long, I won't make it within the 20 seconds, but she taught me the importance of uh, standards and not compromising. It cost me an extra year in grad school. Uh, I didn't like her for a while. I, I just, not going to use the word hate, but I was very angry. Uh, but she taught me a great lesson in that and a lesson I've never forgotten. And may her, may her soul rest in peace, but that is the kind of impact I want to have on, on, on the players that I coach. It is that, because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a tough love. It's a tough love, and it's the, it's the very thing that you remember the most. So that's, that's pretty cool. That takes you, uh, you, you utilize that lesson throughout your entire life. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, on this podcast, I'm talking leadership, disruptors, change makers, it's hoops, it's politics, it's pop culture. It's the net sum of life. So before I let you go, I ask all my guests for some words of wisdom that either they receive that helps guide them or that they want to pass along to others. So President Pastides, what words of wisdom do you have to share? Well, the same ones I share with students all the time. Uh, two things. The first is uh, know what your core values or principles are. Not like I think I know them, but if I ask you and tell you 20 seconds, tell me what they are, you ought to know what they are because you'll need your core values throughout your whole life. Don't be wishy-washy about them. Just speak them, say them, know what they are. And number two, pursue excellence in all that you do. It doesn't really matter if you're a it doesn't matter what, what job you're in or whether you're an athlete or not, but I, I do believe the secret to success and to self gratification is knowing you did your best. And if your best doesn't, you know, if the best doesn't win the game, it's okay. Now, if you didn't play your best, if you didn't bring your a game and you lost the game, unacceptable. And so pursue life with, uh, with excellence. Um, now I'm going to get long. I'm not, I'm not going to get long winded, but, uh, pay it forward, be compassionate about people. Uh, really, it's all about that. It's ashes to ashes, dust to dust, we'll be gone. The real issue is what What did you do while you were here and uh, did you have an impact? So thank you so, so much for allowing me to be on Net, Net Life. I had a wonderful time uh, with you and we'll be following you the rest of this season and for many years beyond. Thank you, President Pestides. Appreciate you coming on. And then lastly, do you have anything you wanna plug or promote? Well, um, <laughs> well, many things. Uh, right now uh, that we, we be uh, compassionate people, um, you know, and uh, care deeply about others, uh, love our university, and, uh, uh, but uh, promote everything about our, our cherished university and higher education across the land. Thank you so much. He's a, he's a leader amongst leaders and definitely an example of excellence when it comes to being the president of a university. Thank you, President Pastides. Thank you, Coach. Great to be with you. And thank you all so much for listening. Don't forget to follow NetLife with Dawn Staley on Apple Podcasts. Uh, subscribe on Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. NetLife is produced by Just Women Sports. For more great sports content, go to JustWomenSports.com. Be sure to subscribe to the newsletter and YouTube channel and follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And this is Dawn Staley signing off and look forward to uh, having some great conversations. Before you see their scores, hear their stories. On the Flame Bearers podcast, top women identifying athletes from around the world share their trials, triumphs, and full selves. With the Beijing Winter Paralympics underway, Flame Bearers second season is live now and highlighting stories from U.S. figure skater Brady Tennell, ROC's Oksana, Abda Carmen Mova, and many more. Get ready for the Beijing games and listen to Flame Bears wherever you get your podcasts.